Ross. Amen. You can be seated. Thank you, Ross. Levi. You need this? Okay. Well, it's been a few months, and we're going to go to the 24th chapter of Matthew tonight. I'm not going to give a big introduction. We're just going to move right into it because they've given me two Wednesdays, and i got to get it done. So let's begin as quickly as we can. I think it's important um, to be reminded of the chronology of the teaching of Jesus. It's not hit and miss. It's not sporadic. There is a definite timeline and sequence to everything that Jesus teaches prophetically. So before you can actually go to the first verse of Matthew 24, you've got to back up a few verses in chapter 23, and you will recall that this is the chapter where he is, is giving this scathing condemnation to the religious leaders, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the scribes, calling them serpents, brood of vipers, how can you escape the condemnation of hell? Uh, Jose, am I okay with this mic? It seems to be ringing up here. Are you guys good with, with it? All right. So he's calling them, I guess, just about the worst name you can call people who claim to be religious. I send you prophets, wise men, and scribes, and some of them you will kill and crucify. Some of them you will scourge in your synagogues and persecute from city to city. Here's the verse that will make the hair stand up on your neck. That on you may come all the righteous blood shed on the earth. What he is saying to that generation, to those ears that day was, all of the sins that have been committed by your people, and all of the blood that was shed, I'm going to put on this generation. I'm calling you to account. Folks, that's the way God does it. He lets it build up. That's why you will have a seven-year tribulation before Jesus Christ comes back to this earth. And the generation that's alive during the tribulation will suffer all for all of the sins that all of the others have committed down through the ages. Now, those people will not escape it. They'll have to stand before the white throne judgment. But that generation that's alive during the reign of the Antichrist and the great tribulation or the tribulation period are going to experience the ultimate wrath of God. He goes on to say, Assuredly, I say to you, all these things will come upon this generation. And if you know anything about history, Bible history and secular history, it happened. It happened in 70 A.D. Uh, when the Romans came in and destroyed the city and killed, I, I've forgotten, uh, two million people I've ha heard estimated, two million Jews, and the remainder of those Jews were scattered throughout the whole earth. Then you come to verse 37. Jesus said, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the one who kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to her, how often I wanted to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, but you were not willing. See? And there's an exclamation point there. Are these scriptures up there? Yes. See, your house is left to you desolate, empty. For I say to you, you shall see me no more till you say, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And that happens when Jesus Christ appears the second time on this earth, and the remnant of Israel, the believing Jews, will recognize him as the one that was crucified by their people 2,000 years ago. Then you move into the 24th chapter, then... Then Jesus went out and departed from the temple, and his disciples came up to show him the buildings of the temple. And Jesus said to them, 
Do you not see all these things? Assuredly, I say to you, not one stone. Now, Jesus didn't operate in hyperbole. He meant what he said. Not one stone shall be left here upon another that shall not be thrown down. Don't have time to go into how the Romans destroyed the city. But they tore down every wall, and not one layer, not one stone was left leaning upon another. It was totally flattened. Verse 3. Now, as he sat on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately saying, Now, Lord, all this stuff you're talking about, when is this going to happen? What will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? You need to put an asterisk beside sign of your coming because in just a few verses, he tells you what that sign is. In fact, it's verse 30. We'll get there in a moment. So, <clears throat> Jesus begins this discourse on what's going to happen to the Jewish people because they have rejected him. I, I cannot emphasize this enough. When I was growing up, um, a, many of these verses were preached as though it, it was given to the church. no. Matthew 24, Matthew 25 are spoken to Israel. The church is not dealt with here. I'll say it again. Jesus slightly revealed that he was going to have a church when he said, upon this rock I'll build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And we didn't really know what the church was, nor did the world, until the day of Pentecost. And then, of course, Paul was caught up to the third heaven, and Jesus sat down with Paul and explained to him how the church was to operate uh, in governmentally, spiritually. He talked about gifts and giving and bishops and elders and preaching. All of that was given to Paul by Jesus concerning the church for the church age, which began on the day of Pentecost and will end when the trumpet sounds and the rapture takes place. So all of this is before that. They said to Jesus, all this stuff you were telling them, uh, when is this going to happen? And Jesus answered and said to them, take heed that no one deceives you. Many will come in my name, saying, I am the Christ, and will deceive many. And you will hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you be not troubled. All these things must come to pass. But the end is not yet. <clears throat> nation will rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom. And what you have here now is the first part of the tribulation period. He's not just talking about history since the church, he's being very specific here. Now, since man fell, there have been wars and rumors of wars and pestilence and deceivers and all of that, but Jesus is uh, specifically delineating what's going to happen to the people who rejected him. He goes on to say, all these things are the beginning of sorrows. The beginning of sorrows. How can that be? Because, remember last fall, Daniel, Revelation, seven years, Daniel's 70th week, the first half is, or the seven years are called the, the tribulation, the second half, the great tribulation. So the tribulation starts off with wars and rumors of wars and pestilence and earthquakes in various places, and that's just the beginning of sorrows. Then they will deliver you. Who is you? Israel. He, he was talking to the disciples, but he is referring to the last days, you being the people of Israel. They will deliver you up to tribulation. They'll kill you. You'll be hated by all nations for my sake. He couldn't have been talking to them right then there and there. Because at that point, all the nations did not hate Israel. 
And then many will be offended and betray one another and will hate one another. Then many false prophets will rise up and deceive many. I think it's important to, to be reminded we won't be here. We won't be here. But there will be such a deception during the tribulation, we can't even comprehend it now. We, saw, we see and hear all of this foolishness that's going on now, gender stuff and woke stuff and all of that insanity, and we think, how can it get any worse? How can people be any blinder? Uh oh, they will be because there's still light in the world. The Holy Spirit is still in the world. The church is still in the world, but when the Spirit and the church are removed, you're going to, well, we won't see it. They'll find out what true blindness, darkness, and deadness are all about. False prophets will rise up and deceive many. And because lawlessness will abound, the love of many will grow cold. Lawlessness, chaos, anarchy. We're headed that way. You know that, don't you? You're seeing bits and pieces and dribbles and drips of it right now. But he who endures to the end shall be saved. He's saying to that Jewish remnant who are not in the body of Christ, they will not be raptured. They will not have a glorified body as we will have. They will be Jews who have recognized Jesus as Messiah they will be saved, and he is telling them, he who endures to the end shall be saved. And this gospel of the kingdom, did you notice that? The gospel of the kingdom. The Jews are looking for a kingdom. The Jews are looking for a land, folks. That's what God promised Abraham <clears throat> and then Moses. I'll give you a land. In their thinking, they are believing that God's going to give them a physical piece of property in the Middle East, and I, of course, believe that too because God's a covenant-keeping God and that land belongs to them. This gospel of the kingdom, forgive me again uh, for coughing my head off all the time, it, it'll be preached in all the world as a witness to all the nations, and then the end will come. You know where that's found in Revelation? Is in Revelation chapter 14. You've got these three angels flying through heaven. One is saying Babylon is fallen, is fallen. The other is saying, uh, I'll have to go there now. Um, uh, well, you look it up. Revelation 14, but anyway, there is an angel flying around the world uh, preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God. And then, after it's preached one more time, the end will come. Now, that's the first half of the tribulation. So now we're about to move into the middle part. Therefore, when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, standing in the holy place. Whoever reads, let him understand. Is everybody familiar with that part of it there, that the Antichrist is going to allow them to rebuild a temple and they're going to start their Jewish worship, temple worship back, and in the middle of the tribulation period, he's going to break his covenant with them and he's going to walk into their new temple and declare that he's God. That will be the worst thing that's ever happened on this earth. It's called the abomination of desolation. He says, when this happens, when the middle, in the middle of the tribulation, when this happens, let those who are in Judea, see, Judea, it's Jewish, flee to the mountains. Let him who is on the housetop not go down to take anything out of his house. And let him who is in the field not go back to get his clothes. But woe to those who are pregnant and to those who are nursing babies in those days and pray. Now, I don't understand this verse here. I'm going to tell you right up front. And pray that your flight may not be in winter or on the Sabbath. 
Now, I understand the Sabbath is Jewish, and he's still talking Jewishly, but I don't understand why he would tell them to pray that it might not be in winter or on the Sabbath. But it'll come to me one day, and it'll come to all of us. The Lord gives you, sometimes he just lets you uh, not understand some things till the right time. For then, verse 21, there will be great tribulation such as has not been since the beginning of the world until this time, no, nor ever shall be. And unless those days were shortened, no flesh would be saved. But for the elect's sake, those days will be shortened. And remember, we talked about the word shortened last fall. It's it's not like God said, oops, I better cut this off. But kind of he did. If it went one more day, everybody would be destroyed. God lets it go to the ultimate, to the apex of agony and misery and danger. And why does he let it stop there? For the elect's sake. Who are the elect? The believing Jews. They are the elect. Now, the word elect is used several times in several ways about different people. We are the elect as the body of Christ. You have the Jewish people, believers, who are the elect. And he said specifically for those Jewish believers, the remnant, the pure Israelites, the righteous sons of Abraham, I'm not going to let it go one moment longer. Therefore, if anyone says to you, look, here is the Christ. Now, remember, there's a lot of deception going on during these, this tribulation period. People are saying, he's over here. No, he's over there. We saw him. He's come. He has come back. Jesus said, if anyone says to you, look, here's the Christ, or there, do not believe it. For false Christs and false prophets will rise and show great signs and wonders. Now, who's going to do that? The false prophets, the Antichrist, will show great signs and wonders to deceive, if possible, even the elect. If God did not keep his hand on them, even the elect, he said, would be deceived by the power of that deception. See, I have told you beforehand. Therefore, if they say to you, look, he is in the desert, don't go out. Or, look, he's in the inner rooms, do not believe it. People are going to be saying, we found him, he's over here, Messiah has come. Some are saying he's out in the wilderness, he's up in the mountains. No, he's in an inner room. He's meeting with people in secret and in silence. Jesus said, don't believe it. And the next verse tells you why. For as the lightning comes from the east and flashes to the west, so also will the coming of the Son of Man be. He said, when I come back, everybody's going to know it. I won't come back to a secret room. I'm not going to come back to the wilderness. I'm not going to hide up in the mountains. When the Son of Man comes back, it's going to be like a flash of lightning from this side to that side. Everybody will see it. Every eye will behold it. My coming is not secret. It will be open. It will change the world. It will shake the heavens. In fact, that's what it says. Uh, Next verse For wherever the carcass is, there the eagles will be gathered together. Have you ever read that verse and said, hmm, what does that mean? Have you? I had four books around me this very day, and every book had a different interpretation of that verse. And these are all good men, and they're all Greek scholars and theologians and spirit-filled people. But the, the majority of those teachers believe that the best interpretation of that is this. Wherever the carcass is, that's death. 
There the eagles will be gathered together. Jesus is saying, when I come back, I'm going to deal with the dead. Those who have rejected me, those who had an opportunity and despised me and decided to remain dead in spirit, just as eagles gather around the carcasses, when I come back, I'm going to judge every sinner. I'm going to judge how the nations treated my people, Israel. It is a certain thing. I'm coming back in judgment. There you go. Next verse. And that word is important there. Immediately after the tribulation of those days, meaning as soon as seven years is finished, as soon as 2,520 days of tribulation are complete, immediately the sun will be darkened, the moon will not give its light, the stars will fall from heaven, and the powers of the heavens will be shaken. Now, we all know that stars are a million times bigger than planet Earth, so he, he is talking about meteorites, and he, he in fact, talked about uh, a hundred pound hailstones following, falling out of the sky. Remember that during the tribulation period? So it's not stars. Uh, but what he's saying is something in the heavenlies, in the sky, the atmosphere is going to change. It's going, the smoke of volcanoes and the smoke of fire and war is going to be so great that it will block out the sun. Moon will not give its light. It'll be a dark, dark, dangerous day. How much more brilliant will the, will the flashing glory of Jesus be when this dark earth sees him like heaven, in heaven, coming back like lightning on the clouds with power and great glory? I always have to throw this in and I'll be right behind him somewhere. And that's as good as you can do. You'll be behind him somewhere. Praise God. If you don't believe that, I don't know what you believe. I'm not going to go through, you know, what it means for people to teach that the church will go through the tribulation. It's such a silly thing. I don't think I'll waste any time here tonight. I, I I dealt with it in great detail last fall. I'm going to read that verse again. Immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened, the moon will not give its light, the stars will fall from heaven, and the powers of the heavens will be shaken. Then the sign of the Son of Man will appear in heaven, and then all the tribes of the earth will mourn. Look at that. It's not a happy thing for the people. They're going to mourn, and they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. Just to make sure now, back up here in verse 3, where it says, and what will be the sign of your coming in the end of the age? Well, verse 30 says, the sign of his coming is his coming. How about that? That's the sign of his coming. What could be plainer than Jesus himself on a white horse in the clouds, in brilliance, and the whole world sees it, and all the tribes of the earth will mourn because of him. Go back to Revelation, and it said, they will realize that this is the Son of Man and they will cry for the rocks and the mountains to fall on them and hide them from the face of God and from the face of the Lamb. It's going to be a fearful time for those unbelievers. Then the sign of the Son of Man will appear in heaven. Tribes will mourn. He'll come back with power and great glory. Here's the verse. And he will send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet. And they will gather together his elect from the four winds, from one end of heaven to the other. That is not the trumpet I preached on last What did I preach on last Sunday? I don't even remember. 
I preached about something of trumpets last Sunday, maybe. It's not the same thing. There are all kinds of trumpets, folks, in the Bible. You know, I told you uh, in the second service, I don't think I mentioned it in the first one, when Paul says, uh, Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep. We shall all be changed in a, mo in a moment in the twinkling of an eye at the last trump. And people say the last trumpet is the seventh trumpet in Revelation. But Revelation had not been written when Paul wrote that. It was 30-something years later that John the Revelator wrote the Revelation with the trumpets and the angels. Paul was talking about a totally different thing, how the Jews would gather their tribes for uh, assemblies and for war with trumpets. And the last trumpet would be the loudest and the longest that would say, this is the final call. And all of the tribes would gather together for, as I said, an assembly or for war. So this verse actually has many, many Old Testament references to it. He'll send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet. They, the angels, will gather together his elect, Israel, believing Israel, from the four winds. What does that mean? Well, they've been scattered again, you see. They were scattered in 70 A.D. and were scattered until they came back and rebuilt the temple in Jerusalem. They're going to be scattered again under the Antichrist and spread about, running for their lives everywhere. But he will gather his elect from the four winds, northeast, southwest, <clears throat> from one end of heaven, there to there, to the other. This is an important verse right here. If uh, Leah, do you mind taking me to Deuteronomy chapter 30, verses 1 through 4? Deuteronomy 30, 1 through 4. Church, or yeah, church. Everything Jesus says is backed up by Old Testament Scripture. Every Scripture backs up every other Scripture. There are no Scriptures that are just hanging out there. Did you know that's what the verse means when it says, no Scripture of, is of any private interpretation? That doesn't mean that no scripture means what I say it means. You know, you've got a private interpretation and a personal interpretation. That's not what it means at all. It means that there's no scripture that is not without another scripture to back it up. It's woven in the Holy Spirit. There isn't just one scripture. There's a scripture, and it's surrounded by many more and bolstered and strengthened and proven by many, many more. So when we come, is that it? To Deuteronomy chapter 30, verse 1. Now it shall come to pass, when all these things come upon you, the blessing and the curse which I have set before you, and you call them to mind among all the nations where the Lord your God drives you, and you return to the Lord your God and obey his voice according to all that I command you today, you and your children with all of your heart and with all of your soul, that the Lord your God will bring you back from captivity and have compassion on you and gather you again from all the nations where the Lord your God has scattered you. If any of you are driven out to the farthest parts under heaven... Are y'all with me? Isn't that beautiful? This is God talking to Israel in Deuteronomy, and we have Jesus talking about the same thing in Matthew. Hallelujah. If any of you are driven out to the farthest parts under heaven, from, from there the Lord your God will gather you, and from there he will bring you. He's already prophesying the last days. And, Leah, if you would... Uh, take us to Isaiah 27, verses 12 and 13. Ready? I'll show you how good she is. There you go. <laughs> Isaiah 27, 12 and 13. And it shall come to pass in that day. Ladies and gentlemen, 
When you see those two words in Scripture, he's talking about the day of the Lord. It shall come to pass in that day that the Lord will thresh from the channel of the river to the brook of Egypt, and you will be gathered one by one, O you children of Israel. So it shall be in, say it, say it. That day the great trumpet will be blown. They will come who are about to perish in the land of Assyria and they who are outcasts in the land of Egypt and shall worship the Lord in the holy mountain of Jerusalem. Isn't that beautiful? You got old Jesus in Matthew and John in Revelation and Moses in Deuteronomy all saying that. I forgot I was wearing my wedding ring and I just really hurt myself there. Saying the same thing. Uh, Leah, how about Isaiah eleven twelve? 12? He will set up a banner for the nations and will assemble the outcasts of Israel and gather together the dispersed of Judah from the four corners of the earth. That's beautiful to me. I get emotional about that sometimes, to think that God's word so divinely written and preserved has not changed, is saying the same thing, is woven together from Genesis 1-1 to the end of Revelation. And it's all about the day when Jesus Christ will be the center of the universe. That's what we're headed for, that day, that day, that day. Let's go on just a couple more verses. Now learn this parable from the fig tree. When its branches already become tender and puts forth leaves, you know that summer is near. So you also, when you see all these things, Know that it is near at the doors. Assuredly, I say to you, this generation will by no means pass away till all these things take place. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words by, will by no means pass away. Some think that when it says this generation, they... It means the generation that sees all these things will not pass away. That, that generation, it's going to happen just like Jesus said, and they will see it. Others believe that the generation, I'm sorry, the word generation, which basically means uh, kindred, family, tribe, that the Lord is saying, I will never allow my people, the kindred of Israel, to be destroyed even though they are going through all of these things. You can decide which interpretation you like best. But then Jesus says that of that day and hour, no one knows. I tell you, God is a specific God. Let me think where it is now. In, it's in the ninth chapter of Revelation, or maybe 16, where it says, in fact, I preached on this the other day. Four angels bound at the great river Euphrates who are prepared for a year, a month, a week, a day, and an hour. Think about that. What they're going to do will happen in a split second at an exact moment. It will not be a gradual thing. You hear that? When the Euphrates dries up, he said it will be because four angels have been loosed who were put there for a specific year, month, day, and hour, and then something's going to happen. Now, I was in the office the other day, and uh, a couple of the girls were saying, look what we found on the Internet. And it's a, uh, a piece on the Euphrates River drying up. Oh, you're nodding like you've seen this. 
maybe I'm out of the loop here. There's some, there's some places you can actually walk across right now. Well, they said, is this, could this be, no, because that's a gradual thing. What he's talking about in Scripture is a, an exact moment when it will dry up and then the armies of the east, 200 million strong, will advance towards the Holy Land. Those Asian armies will actually march there to fight the Antichrist and his armies. But when they arrive, the Antichrist convinces them to join him to fight against this king who's coming back in the power of the Spirit. And of course, Jesus just, you know, the blood up to the horse's bridle and all of that. All of that was said to you because there will be lots of things that will come up on the Internet, lots of reports, lots of things that seem to have reference to last day events and prophetic stuff. And, and, and who can doubt that? But you can never take it out of context and say, see there, the river's always already drying up. That's not the way God does it. It will be a quick thing. I don't know what it'll be. I don't know if it'll be an earthquake, and the, the earth will open its mouth, and uh, the waters will begin to gush to the bottom. I don't know. Because we know during the tribulation period, the whole earth is going to be um, redone. The, the whole face of the earth, earthquakes, and Mountains falling into the sea. You know, the cosmetic of the earth is, will be totally changed. So don't speculate too much. Don't get too hyped up on something on the Internet. Don't, you know, start jumping up and down about stuff. Anybody writes except the Holy Spirit. Are we good with this? I, I, I hope sometimes people don't think I'm rude when they say, did you see this? Well, what is it? Well, this is what they're saying about the Antichrist or the false prophet or something. I don't want to, I don't. They don't know anything. This is what gives you the information you need. And all that's interesting. I'll tell you this, though, and this is going to be, just take me a moment. Ed over here sent me... Um, something the other day about a school in Pennsylvania. Right, Ed? You helped me walk through this. And they now have a satanic... What? Extracurricular satanic club for the kids to join. I, I, where's my phone? But I, I read all of that stuff in there. And one of, the, one of the things it says, if I can remember correctly, that Satan is a literary figure that represents uh, a movement to rebel against authority. What it's saying is rebelling against God. And then it says, has anybody found it yet? Your kids will learn how to, they will learn their own sovereignty and how to stand against uh, superstition, which they mean Christianity. Now, that's in a high school. Is that right? High school. Mid middle school? Just let a group of Christian kids try to have a prayer meeting and see what happens. Folks, it's so obvious now the light is getting lighter and the dark is getting darker. And that's why we have to know this book. This book. I don't know. Greg, you think I'll get in trouble tonight? You, you don't? I know he, my sister, my wife, everybody starts drawing up when I do something like that. About a month ago on a Sunday morning after the second service. I was exhausted. I just sat down over there where the orchestra sits, and one of the security guys came over, and he, 
he had his hand like this. He said, someone would like to speak with you. And I said, who is it? And he, he did that. And I said, okay. I went over there. And the lady said, we want to talk to you. She was a lady, but there was a man with her dressed like a woman. And the lady did most of the talking. She said, this is my roommate. And I looked at him. He said, I'm Olivia. And I said, okay. She said, we think we found our church. We want to join the church. We want to join the choir. We want to get involved in ministry. Is this true, Pastor Greg? And so I'm standing there, right? And I'm tired. And I, and I, I ain't got time for this. And so I'm trying to think how to diplomatically say the right thing because I think we were being set up. See, I believe it. And about the time I was about to tell them to find Greg Baker, <laughs> Gail walked up behind me and said, Pastor, I'll handle this. And, uh, and Gail handled it. I think she let them know you don't just come in and join. And we, you know, we welcome everybody, but there's a process, and you got to prove yourself. And, uh, and whatever information you need, call us, and we'll help you. Well, I haven't seen hiding her hair since. Now, I'm trying not to get stirred up. But you, as a church, need to be careful here. Because people will single you out to try to get you to say something. They'll find somebody that thinks, you know, I'm an oh, it's a conservative and I don't like, and they'll ask you a question about this church and what we believe. So you be, you be very, very careful. We've had to give this talk to all of our employees and realize that these are the last days. And um, everybody that comes here does not have a good intention. And I'm acutely aware of that. But I'm not going to put up with it either, you know. I'm not going to lie down and be scared. I, 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 we can handle it. You know, we've got lawyers, and we got all our stuff in a row. We got our stuff together. So I just want you to know this stuff goes on. It goes on down at, at the office all the time. People show up with all kinds of crazy intentions and et cetera. But if we pray... If we stay filled with the Spirit, there is something called spiritual discernment. And God will let us know who's right and who's wrong. Now, I've just used up all my time. Well, actually, I didn't. I have two minutes. Um, you know what? I think I will stop because I'm going into the 25th chapter next week and talk about how uh, lots of people think that the parable of the ten virgins Five wise, five foolish have to do with the church. It does not. It's all Israel. Jesus is still teaching here. So we'll go into detail with that next week. The clock says it's 7.58. Would anybody like to ask a question? Good. <laughs> but I do that too because I don't preach and then run out. On Sunday morning, I hang around. I'm almost one of the last ones to leave because I don't. If I'm going to say it, I'm going to stand there and defend it. So I see. A, do I see a hand? Or yes? Can you speak out, sir? Yes. Well, for the rapture. It's just one trumpet for us. But when you get into Revelation, there are seven trumpets that seven angels blow, and that's to bring in greater and greater misery upon the earth. So that's seven more trumpets. And every year during the millennial reign of Christ, which is a thousand years, a trumpet is going to be blown at the Feast of Tabernacles. A, a trumpet blast. So there's a thousand trumpets right there. Seven in Revelation. 
one for the rapture. Then you had a whole bunch of them in the Old Testament because of the feasts of trumpets that Israel celebrated. So does that help any? The trumpet that matters to me and you is the next one. The next one. Yes. That's going to be the last one for us. All the other trumpets will be blown as judgment during the tribulation period, but as worship during the millennial reign of Christ. That's a good question, too. Yes, ma'am. Microphone, yeah. That's a <laughs> microphone. Um, talking to the Jews, the elect, and the Jews that are, it's all about Israel and the Jews. So I guess the unbelieving Gentiles are just going to be Running around like crazy. <laughs> well, they'll be lost, but there will yeah. be Gentiles who will believe that message right. and be saved. And that's what we're going to get into next week because when Jesus comes back, he's going to judge the unbelieving Jews and then he's going to judge the Gentiles, sheep nations and goat nations. The goat nations will have mistreated Israel and sinned against Almighty God. The sheep nations will have befriended and helped the nation of Israel. So we'll get into that next week. Does that help any? Hey. Let, Pastor. Sometimes did, I just oh, want to say what I feel and I can't get it out. I, I want to make sure everybody understands that I do not have this blind affection for the nation of Israel. I don't think it's ever been this quiet. <laughs> that I think that they can do no wrong. Israel is a wicked, vile, God-hating, Messiah-hating nation. The only reason that I, as a believer, support them is because God made a covenant with them. And there is a remnant. There's a remnant within the nation of Israel. The others are, will be thrown into the lake of fire. But Israel is not a righteous nation today. They're crooked. They're mean. I was in uh, Abud. Does anybody know where Abud is? It's in, it's in Israel. It's a, it's a little Palestinian village. I was over there having lunch with some Palestinian believers in fact, I went in and prayed for a, a grandfather that was dying. They asked me to come in and pray for him. Then we ate the best pita bread and hummus and olives and tea. It was a great thing. But I asked them. We had a school there. We supported a wonderful, we had 200 students in that school at one time. And I asked somebody, I don't know why I did, I said, where are all the trees? Where are all the olive trees? I always heard this was place had olive trees everywhere. They said, Israel cut them down. Cut them down because they say we have snipers in those trees. We don't have snipers in those trees. That's our livelihood. So, you know, you got to keep this thing balanced, folks. You can't say all Arabs are bad. All Palestinians are bad. All Israel is good. You know, you better keep a biblical perspective on this. And while we talk about Israel being the covenant people of God, don't ever forget that God made the same covenant with the Arabs. He will make great princes out of them one of these days. So is everybody with me here? Um, sure, we support Israel. But we support all the nations, the Palestinian believers as well. It's not Israel only. It's Israel in addition to. Enough, is that enough said? Because if I keep talking, some of you will go, ah, oh, gee, I don't, I don't think I'll go over there now. <laughs> yeah, you go ahead. Have a good time. Any more questions? 
I thought that you taught when you were teaching Daniel about Israel and there only being a third of Israel left. Do you know, isn't there somewhere that, 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 that during the tribulation there's only a third? Is Zechariah said that, Zechariah said two-thirds of the Israel, uh, Jewish population will be destroyed during the tribulation. And so the elect that this is talking about are, are the what's left in the one-third? That's what's left in the one-third. And they will all be believers, the one-third? Or no, they will be some that are left? Some in and, there because he's going there. to judge some of them. Okay. Uh, and we'll see that again next week. They'll be shut out of the wedding feast. So you ought to study 24 and 25 next week. Yeah, you're right. Okay. But also a third of mankind, half of the human race is going to be destroyed during the tribulation period. Half of the human race, two-thirds of the Jewish people. Folks, it's, it's going to be a bad day. The longer I talk, the louder I get, so it's time to quit. <laughs> Are you ready to go home? Uh, well, ask me a question then. They cannot hear you. The 144,000 Jews will preach the everlasting gospel of the kingdom during the tribulation period. They are a people picked out, 12,000 from each tribe. They are a people who will have an experience similar to what Paul the apostle had. He was a total unbeliever until Jesus knocked him to the ground and said, I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. Jesus will do that to 12,000 uh, in each of the 12 tribes, and they will rise to their feet and say, Lord, what will you have me do? And they will go throughout the world preaching the gospel. 144,000, literally. That's not symbolic, folks. It's literal. That's a good question, too. Anybody else? All right, thank you. Stand and let's thank Jesus for his word. Thank you for your word, Jesus. <laughs> Thank you for this good food we've enjoyed tonight. Thank you for the uh, interest that you've given us for it. Teach us your ways and lead us in a plain path. Till next week, Lord, or till Sunday, guide every one of us, and may we honor you in all we do. Read 25 of Matthew for next week, if you will, please. Night, night.